Hi and welcome back to this fourth lecture in this lecture series on CCNA2 routing and switching essentials with me Joachim Fjellestad from the University of uh, Skövde. And this chapter four is actually a fully theoretical lesson where we're going to discuss local area network design and the switched environment and how a switch work. So up until this point, we've been focusing on routing and the router, and now we're switching focus for the next couple of classes. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is switches. Uh, so what we're going to do first is that we're going to look at uh, local area network design and we're going to look at, uh, well, basically the Cisco design approach and you can take it for what it is, but it's uh, something that you need for, for this course at least. Um, and as with anything that is uh, d developed by a company, it's uh, quite a lot of do this with the, these Cisco devices, but there is some theoretical background uh, as well and that's what I'm trying to emphasize in this lecture. So if you're reading the material, you will see that there are some, some material on uh, how different LEDs work on uh, different Cisco switches and what Cisco swi switch model to use in which scenario. Uh, and I've actually omitted that from this lesson to try to focus on, on the common, common things that is common for all manufacturers and the, the background theory. So then we're going to look at the switched environment and we're going to look at how the switch handles and forwards um, in traffic and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, collision and broadcast domains. So let's move on and to talk about the topic of converged network. So we already talked about converged networks into domain routing, which is when all routers are aware of the uh, of the same routes when we use, use a dynamic routing protocol, but you can also talk in converged networks in, in terms of what type of traffic the, the network can manage. So uh, to set a stage, you should know that modern networks has grown to be much more complex. In, a, in the traditional sense, you built a network to house data traffic, which would be uh, emails, surfing the internet, stuff like that. But including data, modern networks are also expected to have stuff like call control. You should have be able to have a um, a way to uh, to use phones and to have call control, including the telephone uh, in voicemail. You should have uh, waiting queues, all of that stuff. You should also be able to have voice messaging, and you're expected to have a good. Uh, a good approach approach to mobility in your network, meaning that you should seamlessly be able to uh, to move from one place to another and still man maintain uh, connectivity to the network in a nice way. Uh, so when we talk about a converged network, that is a network that supports multiple types of traffic, including, for instance, voice over IP, that's uh, IP telephony, uh, data, video conferencing, and and more. And uh, traditionally, as you may know, there's been different networks for uh, for each and every type of traffic. So you had have had one telephony network, you've had one data network, you may even had one specific video conferencing network. But in a modern converged networks, you have one network that is able to support all those different types of traffic. Uh, and in one sense, that's a good thing because there's only one network to manage. But on the other hand, it brings for more complexity on the network because what happens is that the requirements on the network is increased. So let's move on to discuss the Cisco borderless networks. And Cisco borderless network is basically a network architecture or a design architecture that can, and this is a nice way of saying things, that can connect anyone, anywhere, anytime, on any device, securely, reliably, and seamlessly and well yeah this is what you want to do in any network of course you want to have a good connectivity to anyone anytime and so on and so forth and you want to do it securely uh, reliably and seamlessly but yeah let's look at this uh, network architecture a little bit so a borderless switched network design is built around uh, some design principles and those design principles are actually important so we have a hierarchical modularity resiliency and flexibility and um, and hierarch and a hierarchical network well that's uh, that means that we have a network built um, as the uh, three tier model that we're going to explore in the next slide where we have a hierarchy within the networks we have different parts of the network doing different things if we need to expand on one part we only need to expand there and so on and so forth 
Uh, then modularity is an approach where we let different areas of the network handle different things. So we can see parts of the networks as functions. So, uh, so that is the voice of, of IP stuff. That is the, uh, I don't know, video conferencing stuff and so on and so forth. So we can easily uh, add or remove functions to the network and we can easily expand to in the area that needs to be exp expanded and so on and so forth. Uh, then we have resiliency, and resiliency is basically that we have a network that can withstand errors, that can provide a good uptime, and so on and so forth. And we also talk about a network in terms of flexibility, meaning that the network should again be able to, to grow in size, uh, it should be flexible in terms of how users can access the network, and so on and so forth. And those uh, design principles, those are, you can see them as achievable goal, goals. There is always the little issue that is uh, sort of pulling all of those back, and that is, you know, this old bugger, which is cost. If things are expensive, well, they are if you try to aim for the highest possible hierarchy, modularity, resiliency, and flexibility. But these are sort of goals that you want to achieve when you're designing a network. Uh, and you should also know that what we discussed before, the uh, three-tier network design model is an integral part uh, of achieving a Cisco borderless network. And just to review, remember that we have this three-tier model that begins from bottom up with the access layer down here, which is the layer where we have uh, where we have the network edge that connects end users to the network, where we have uh, fast, uh, we have a lot of switch ports, and so we can facilitate a lot of a lot of devices wanting to be connected. We may want to have uh, power over Ethernet on this layer so that we can power our IP telephonies and so on and so forth. And then we have the distribution layer that's in charge of, well, basically aggregating broadcast domains and provide a interface between the core layer and the access layer. And here you want to provide a high level of availability using redundant switches and so on and so forth. And finally, we have the core layer on top, which is the network backbone, and that should provide fault isolation as well as a high speed backbone connectivity. Now looking at the next slide, that's in text what I just said, so let's just skip it. Uh, and we're going to discuss instead the role of switched networks. So when we talk about the switched networks, uh, there are some things that we want to achieve. So again, we want to achieve flexibility, but we can also use switches for traffic management, quality of service, uh, improved security, uh, support for wireless networking, and support for new technologies such as IP telephony and mobility services. So all of those things are stuff that we can achieve with switches, and maybe this is not a part of the course, but if we look about at routers contra switches, you should know that a switch um, usually have a lot more ports than a router, so it can connect more devices, and it also usually has a much faster backplane, meaning that it's uh, that it is much better at shuffling traffic uh, quickly between ports. So this is something that we're going to discuss a little bit more in a little while, but this is the reason why you want switches. However, as you're going to see later, there are also some drawbacks me uh, that makes you want to have router at some instances. But in modern network, it's actually my opinion that the number of routers has decreased uh, in favor of switches. And especially now that we have uh, layer 3 switches being quite common, a layer 3 switch that is a switch that has some routing functionality that can route between different networks, uh, for instance. And so now it's very common that we use layer 3 switches within uh, at least uh, the, if we go back, at least the distribution layer, uh, but in some cases even at the core layer. Um, so that we can put the routing in between uh, some nets closer to the end host and s s stuff like that. We're going to explore this further in uh, in chapter chapter six, I think. So moving on to a, a short discussion on how sh how we should select switches. Well, uh, there are of course some business considerations when we select switching equipment, and the overall questions is you can have them uh, as a triangle. Uh, that's not a triangle, but we have our needs, and then we have our money, and then we may also have some wishes. And it's sort of a contest in between those two. So we may buy a switch that supports our needs and that supports our every wishes, but then the money factor is going to be high. 
uh, and usually we have a money factor that is at least uh, crossing out the wishes part so we have to buy something that is as good as possible for the money that we have but other than that there are some different uh, uh, some different factors to consider especially when we buy switches and well first of course the cost and the cost of a switch will depend on for instance the number of ports the speed of the ports if we have fast ethernet i guess no one buys that anymore but fast ethernet gigabit ethernet 10 gigabit ethernet and so on and so forth and um, also what features it supports if it's a layer 2 switch if it can support some routing what type of security um, if it's uh, uh, ex if you can expand it easily and so on and so forth and then we have the uh, word port density and port density is basically how many ports there are on the switch and this is an issue that is uh, important in two ways first off of course we need to have uh, enough ports to support our users we need one port for every computer unless they're connecting through wireless uh, and we also need some spare ports uh, in order to grow but there is also the term port density in in terms of how how dense the ports are actually physically configured because a switch uh, as you know by now will be positioned in a rack mount and we only have so much rack space so we actually want to get as many ports as possible out of the rack space that we have uh, next is power and when we talk about power, you should know that it's now common to use switches to actually uh, supply powers to access points, uh, IP phones, and even more. And this is done using a technology that is called power over ethernet, which is supplying power over the ethernet cable. Uh, and if we have devices that we want to power over ethernet, then we have to have power over ethernet enabled switches. And um, also reliability. Uh, we have test switches that can provide a good uptime, port speed, uh, again, how fast are the ports, um, frame buffers, and frame buffers, that is how many frames, how many packets the switch can store internally. And this is important because when there is network congestion, you know, uh, which is when, if the switch is for a while not able to forward, uh, forward traffic out a, a couple of ports, then the switch will have to store the incoming packets internally until it can begin forwarding again. But if the frame buffer gets full, if it can't store anymore in its internal memory, it's going to start dropping frames. So we need uh, or we want to have large frame buffers. And finally, scalability. Does the switches that we select provide the ability to grow? Uh, and there is actually something that I think is missing in all of this, and that should be added. That is the backplane. And backplane is the internal forwarding rate uh, inside the switch. So we may buy a, a let's say, a 24-port switch with gigabit ports. So that is 24 gigabits of data that we can shuffle in between uh, out in and out reports. However, the backplane is the internal forwarding speed and that has to be at least equally uh, equally high. So if we're buying a, a 24 port gigabit switch that only has a one gigabit backplane, we can still only forward traffic uh, in and out of that switch at a rate of one gigabyte. And the backplane is actually something that usually differs between switches in different price ranges. So if, if you're at uh, Amazon or whatever and you're looking at switches and you see one 24 port gigabit switch going for $100 and you see another going for $1,000 maybe you should have a look at a backplane because that is a common difference and I'm saying this to make sure that whenever you choose switches you choose switches that actually support your business need in terms of not only port speed but also the internal switching speed so let's move on and uh, there are also four factors to know about and we have uh, for uh, three different form factors that we're discussing in this course beginning with fixed configuration that is is the uh, CCNA lab switches uh, fixed configuration is a switch where what you see is what you get really uh, a 24 board port switch will stay a 24 port switch there is no room for for expanding it or for decreasing the number of ports and so on and so forth and in contrast we have modular configuration and a modular configuration is basically where you buy a switch chassis and then you can uh, buy line cards and line cards are uh, holding the actual ports. So you buy a modular switch, a chassis, and you can buy uh, line cards with whatever ports you need. So if you need like 24 uh, gigabit port, 
port, you buy that land card. If you're happy with the 48 fast Ethernet port, you buy that land card, land card. Uh, if you need fiber, you buy fiber line cards and so on and so forth. So those are very modular. And then we also have the stackable switches and those are switches that can be in interconnected to work as one unit. So uh, that is sort of a way that you can expand uh, a switch, but you do it by buying another switch and connecting them using a special cable. And then you have the Cisco Stackwise technology that allows you to, uh, to bundle those switches together and you have a master switch and you do the configuration from there. So uh, now we're going to look at frame forwarding. So uh, we've been talking about routing, which is uh, routers that take a forwarding decision based on layer three addressing, which is usually the IP address, but switches they forward traffic based on layer two addresses, which is the MAC addresses or the physical address. And there is some terminology that we need to know about. So first we have the ingress port and the ingress port is the port where a frame enters the switch and the egress port is where the frame leaves the switch. So entry port uh, is the ingress port and exit port is the egress port. And you should also know that the switch, much like a router, keeps record on what port a device is connected to using a MAC address table. It's also called a CAM table, but we will use the term MAC address table in this course. And it is made up from pairs of destination addresses and ports. So whenever uh, when the switch is up and running, it should be aware of the MAC addresses of every device that is connected to it. And it gets to, to that stage with, through a learning process. And what actually happens is that a switch will record the MAC address of every device connected to any of its ports. And it will do this whenever it receives a frame. So whenever the switch re receives a frame, what's going to happen is that it's going to examine the frame's source MAC address. So if, if you have a switch and there is an incoming package on port number one, then the switch is going to look at the frame source MAC, addresses, MAC address on that frame. So it's going to read the address of where that frame came, and then it's going to add it to the MAC address table. Uh, so if the uh, if that MAC address already exists, it's going to update a refresh timer uh, because by default, most, most switches will store those entries in the MAC address table for five minutes. Um, and if uh, so, if the uh, MAC address is already in the table, the refresh timer is updated. If the entry is not already in the table, it's just added. So uh, the next thing that's going to happen is that it's going to examine the destination MAC address so to see where to send it. And then it's going to see if it can find a destination MAC address table, uh, MAC address in the MAC address table. If it can, the frame will be forwarded out the correct port. If it cannot find the destination MAC address, the switch will send the frame out all ports except the ingress port. And this is called the unknown unicast. So what you need to know here is that whenever a switch receives a frame and it doesn't know where to send it, it's going to forward it out uh, all ports except the ingress port. So this is usually called, or this is called an unknown unicast because it's still a unicast uh, package and it's sometimes called um, wrongly a broadcast. So the switch doesn't broadcast, it sends an uni uh, unknown unicast, which is much, much like a broadcast, but it's a difference in the terminology. So uh, let's just discuss switch forwarding methods a little while. And there are actually two different approaches in how switches forward traffic. So the first one is called store and forward. And store and forward switching is uh, when the switch will receive the entire frame on the, uh, on the switch, then it's going to do a cyclic redundancy check, which is a technique that is used by the switch to um, to take the whole package, calculate a checksum, and then at the end of the frame, there is already a pre a checksum that was calculated by the sender. It's going to match the checksums and see uh, if there are any errors in the frame. Then if the frame is, uh, is correct, then the frame is going to be forwarded. And you should know that this is Cisco's primary lo local area network sw uh, sw uh, switching methods. If if things serves me right, it's actually not the default switching method on all Cisco switches, but it's Cisco's suggested switching method for local area network switches. 
And then in contrast to store and forward, we have cut through switching. And cut through switching is when forwarding begins when the destination MAC and egress port has been determined. So looking just looking at a mock-up of a frame, you know we have a frame here, uh, not looking exactly like this, but in the frame we're going to have a uh, source MAC, we're going to have a destination MAC, we're going to have uh, data, and we're going to have this checksum. So I'm just writing CRC. So if we do storm forward, the entire switch is going to be received. The entire switch uh, or the entire frame is going to be received. There is going to be a, a CRC calculation. And when that happened, uh, the frame will be forwarded out the correct, the correct interface. Oops. Uh, sorry for that, but when we have cut through the switch only needs to receive this part uh, The source and destination MAC address because when it has the destination MAC address It can decide where to send the frame and then for the frame forwarding can begin even before the entire frame is received The drawback however with cut through switching is that the CRC is not happening and Since we don't calculate the CRC then we run the risk of forwarding uh, broken frames. So there is a version of cut through that is called fragment free and fragment free is a version of cut through where the first 64 bits of the frame is examined uh, to ensure that there is no fragmentation uh, in that part and that does provide some error, check, uh, uh, some error checking. Uh, so now that we have discussed this part I just want to go back to the switch learning just to emphasize that the switch when it boots up it's going to have a empty MAC address table but as soon as there is a package entering the switch it's going to examine the source MAC address of that package and add that MAC address and a corresponding port number to its MAC address table and that's how the switch learns and it's then when it's forward it, it uh, forwards traffic when it makes forwarding decisions it's going to refer to its MAC address table and if it can not find the uh, recipient in the MAC address table, it's going to flood the frame out all ports except the ingress port, and this is known as a U uh, unknown unicast. And if it knows the recipient, of course, it's going to forward the frame out the correct port. So I want you to take a break here, uh, ask questions to your teacher if you have one, um, otherwise you can ask questions in the comment field and maybe someone will answer sometime. But otherwise you should at least pause and do the end of section quizzes that are no denoted 4.2.1.6 and 4.2.1.7 because they are very good to really um, self check yourself on this material. Uh, so then we're, what we're going to do now is that we're going to move on with discussing collision broadcast domains and and that is basically the end of this lecture. So a collision, so what is a collision domain? Well, uh, you know that devices connected to hubs uh, or half duplex switches, they do create a collision domain because remember that we have uh, half and full duplex uh, or actually we have simplex, half duplex and full duplex connections where simplex is a connection that can, where you can only send data in one way. Half duplex is where you, is a connection where you can only send or where, where you can send data uh, back and forth but you can only send in one direction at a time and full duplex allows you to send data back and forth at the same time. So devices connected to hubs or half duplex switches, so whenever you use half duplex, uh, you have a collision domain. And when more one, two or more devices in a collision domain communicates at once, a collision will, will occur. And managing collisions, that will degrade network performance. So if we just take an example and do a line here, so this is a half duplex line, you can only communicate in one or the other way at once, but there's going to be a device at each end. And if both want to communicate with the other simultaneously, well, then there's going to be a big crash in the middle and nothing gets forth and managing those collisions, that is what degrades network performance. Uh, however, you should know that switches operating in full duplex, they will eliminate uh, collisions because if you want to see it graphically, a full duplex connection between two devices would basically be two lines, one going in each direction. So there is 
So when this device A is going to send to B, then this cable is used, and when B wants to send something back, this is used. So there is no problem if they send both at the same time. So there will be no um, so there will be no collisions. Uh, modern switches will negotiate duplex mode and full duplex communication will take place if both switches have that capability and unless you're working with really old stuff that is pretty much always the case. So next is broadcast domains and what you should know here is that a collection of connected switches uh, they form a broadcast domain and the broadcast domain basically defines how far a broadcast inside the domain will spread. So basically, a, a broadcast as it will spread on the IP network where it originated, and when a switch forwards a broadcast frame, it is actually going to forward that out all ports except the ingress port. So you should know that broadcast domains are limited by routers and uh, VLANs, as we're going to, not wireless network, but virtual local area networks that we're going to explore in chapter six. <laughs> And the reason why you should know this is because when you're designing networks, you want to limit the size of the broadcast domains because there are broadcast data that is sent out in the network like all the time. And if we have too many devices sending uh, broadcasts in a too large network, well, then there's going to be a lot of flooding of packages. So uh, before we end, I'm just going to have a slide on network congestion. So network congestion can, it can basically be seen as when there is too much happening on the network uh, to be room for more. You can see network con congestions, uh, congestion as uh, queues on a highway. So if you've ever been to a larger city and you've dri driven on a highway, you know that there are usually, I don't know, maybe you're allowed to drive at 80 miles an hour. But, so that would be um, that would be an analogy to your port speed. However, if there is so much traffic, everything may be still or going at like one mile an hour anyway, and that would be congestion on that road. So we have the same problem in networking, uh, since we actually do have physical cables. If there is too much traffic, then things are gonna get slow, uh, and we're gonna have bottlenecks. So and the bottleneck can be a connection, it can be a device or or whatever. So mitigating network congestion, that is done by having high port density because more ports means more connections, means more ways for traffic to take. So the analogy here would be uh, to build another highway and another highway allows for more cars to be on the same highway uh, at the same time. Also large frame buffers as we discussed before so that switches can store more traffic internally and if because that's what happens if the network is congested, the switch has to start storing traffic internally so that it can forward it later, but if the switch gets full, then package are, packages are going to start getting dropped. Uh, also, port speed flexibility. Uh, if we can manage the speed of our ports, then we can um, mitigate network congestions. Uh, fast internal switching, you re remember the black backplane, and also uh, switches mitigate network congestions by having low per port cost, so it's usually quite cheap to add a couple of extra ports. So with that said, this was the end of lecture four of this CCNA2 video, uh, video lecture series. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time where we get back to be a little bit more practical about the switches. Bye.